To whom much is given, much is required. Part of that requirement is sharing. Culture is the heartbeat within our lives, and it's at the core of so many things. While we live in a time when we are starving for wisdom, I welcome you to your wisdom retreat at Culture Raises Us. Well, well, well. Wow. Today's guest is the one and only Swin Cash. So good to see you. Her see you. accomplishments um, and accolades are, are many, with being a recent Basketball Hall of Fame inductee. After having a very, very illustrious career in the WNBA, which we're all so proud, and is now in the front office of the New Orleans Pelicans as the VP of Basketball Operations. Uh, but before she goes in depth on who she is outside of all this, I want to welcome you to the show first, and then start with the question that we tee up for all of our guests, and it is, when you hear culture, what does that mean to you? Yeah, that, uh, that word culture it, for me, especially being a, a, a black woman, um, it is the driver of everything. It's in the fabric, it's in your DNA, whether it's sports, it's entertainment. Uh, it dictates how we evolve. And whether that's in our music, like I said, it's in entertainment. Um, it has been the driving force for so long. And so when I think about culture, to me, it's like the DNA of who we are as a people as we evolve. I love that. You know, Word. driver and DNA really resonate with me as well when you talk about culture. Um, so thank you for that. So now, tell everybody a little bit more about yourself. I gave them the very high level, but there's so many levels of what I call amazement to you. So give the people a little bit of that. Yeah, so, um, and you know, I do not like doing this. but I, I, And that's why I wanted you here for all of this, and you deserve all of this. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I played 15 years in the WNBA. I I am a mother, a, a wife, a daughter, a friend, um, an advocate, um, an ally. I I feel like I've been so blessed throughout my life and to experience sport at the highest level. Um, there's not a level that I haven't won on, which is, uh, is why I try to always say that, you know, I, I never remembered a single awards that I've won, but I always remember the championships. And, you know, for me, talk about culture, culture also is winning. And um, I believe in that. I believe in winning not only on the court, but in life and everything that you do. Um, and so that's how I approach my day-to-day -day is the mindset of having that winning edge. Yeah, you know, as I look at your, your journey and your championship pedigree, as you talk about across all facets of your career, it, it doesn't surprise me that your commitment to empowering others um, comes through literally in everything that you do. I, I really believe that, you know, you are a great representation of a cultivator in the space of female empowerment, right? And I want to thank you really, really, really from the bottom of my heart for all that you do and who you are more importantly. And so as you were just talking about, you know, being a champion literally at all levels, at all levels, of sport um, and the brands that you've kind of been affiliated with and even the fellow athletes that you've rubbed shoulders with and worked with. Um, over the years, was there a particular moment though where you realized just how big and instrumental the sport culture was to our overall culture as we know it? Yeah, I think one that played out on a national stage that I can just speak to briefly would be in 2016 when the collective of the WNBA decided um, to take a stand and right. to have a media blackout and to show our resistance against what was happening with police brutality throughout the country. And it was a time when you think you're in leadership positions, but you really don't know... <laughs> how much leadership you really need to have or how much resolve you need to have. And so you're really um, hit with an opportunity to show that and to not make it about you, but to make it about the collective. In 2016, after the country was going back and forth with the death of uh, Philandro Castile, Alter, Alter, um, Alter Sterling, um, it was a period in time where we decided to do media blackouts, right? And I'm playing in New York and the whole league had gotten fined and it came down from the league office. And then it was just a whole whirlwind of 
are you going to continue to stand and take the fines or are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to worry more about myself than I am about where this country is headed. And it was so empowering after the talk mm-hmm. to all of these different women and different teams about where we, wh- what, what this meant for us. And we were in it in the moment. We weren't thinking about the future. We weren't thinking about the fines, the people who had money, but think about this. You have women who were making $30,000 who were Man. like, I can I can't right. afford to get fine. That part. But what what I learned from the experience was I saw veterans, I saw other people, even myself being like, I'll pay your fine. I'll pay your fine. We have to be a collective because no movement ever moves the needle if you're not together. And so having those conversations behind the scene, being up through throughout the whole night, figuring out who's gonna do what, who's gonna talk, who's gonna speak. Um the real moment I remember being in New York when both the Indiana uh, fever and the New York Liberty decided to just stand. And we weren't going to talk to any media about basketball. That was the first time ever where teams had been like, no, we're not talking about the game. We're going to talk about here are, here are the things we want to talk about. Here's what you need to address. And I remember being at center court with Tamika Ketchings after the game with this picture of us standing there so intense. And I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. And she's like, sis, you ready to do this? I said, I'm ready. You're sat ready. We're ready. And we walked back to our locker rooms and it just kept going from there. So that was a pivotal time, I think, in the WNBA. I think it was showing the country how women could be a collective together and stand together. And I think in sports, it will always be a moment in time for yeah, us. I, I agree 1000%. I'm so glad you use that example because when you were talking, the thing I think about is, you know, courage looked like, looks like insanity to a coward. Right. And in that moment, the level of courage that it took for all to galvanize around something bigger than them. It also then took leaders like yourself within the collective of leaders to put others at ease from a financial point of knowing, don't worry, we got you. Because that's a, that was a real thing. When you look at yeah. the disparity of pay within the WNBA and the women who stood in that moment and didn't even know you just you just said thirty thousand? Did you say yeah. thirty thousand? Getting paid, yeah. And it, it it was you know, and I also want to give shout out to to even um the Minnesota Lynx. You had Maya Moore who's been leading in this space since she made her decision. You had Lindsay Whalen, Sylvia Fowl, um I, I mean Simona Gusta. We can go on and on, but there were so many women that said, No, 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 no. We're going to do this together. And there's always strength in numbers. Look back at yeah. the civil rights movement and other movements that have happened. It has exactly. never been one. You cannot stand alone when you're trying to do radical progress. And so I, I would, that was a moment for me in sports that I'll never forget. And I'm so proud of the W and I'm so proud of where they are now today and how they continue to push the uh, the envelope forward. Yeah, no. And, and as you look at that and now that you're on the other end, on the executive side now, you know, what perspective do you hope to bring to other teams in the league who have yet to kind of embrace, um, you know, females or, or black leaders in, in higher level positions? <laughs> you know, understanding that it's a process for sure, right? And the movement has started, and you, you talked about some of this movement. But what steps do you think are necessary to accelerate it? Yeah, I think having conversations like the one you and I are having, I think speaking up and trying to help people understand. And I say this all the time and I will. This is one of those heels where I will stand on and then roll down (laughs) is that you have to have diversity of thought in the room and these decision making rooms, not because you're trying to bang on your chest with D&I and say, you know what, we're hitting our marks and checking the box. It's because it's good business. Mm. If you look at any business or any movement that's happening, is you have to have women, and especially black women who are in the room, as being change agents. And so I advocate so hard for women in spaces because if you want to do good business, then you better have some good people around you, and that better include the diversity of thought with your women. Mm. And also be reflective of the consumers you serve. Yes, yes. A lot of times we try to elevate the leaders and executives, whether it's in corporate, whether it's in sports, and you want to have everybody to have a seat at the table down here, but sometimes the decision-making is happening up here. So the room up here has to look 
like it's supposed to in your consumers in order to trickle all the way down. This from the bottom up and not from the top down is where you run into a lot of problems and where you see some of these campaigns. We talk about the culture, right? Mm -hmm. Campaigns and like, Y'all didn't have anybody in the room when you released that campaign. That part. Or you didn't think it was good to, you know, that your athlete is going through this right now. Do you still want to roll them out, talk to media about X, Y, and Z issue when you didn't prepare them or Man. give them more insight? And so I think that is why having a diverse gift thought in the room is so, so important. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a major part of a toolbox that I think all industries, all brands should be super passionate about ensuring that they utilize this toolbox, right? Um, and that being, if you want to call it diversity of thought, which I, I love that POV because that what? breaks down a lot of the walls that some get caught up on, right? It's, it's, it's about bringing the different thought to create and complement that of initiative that's going to be able to speak to a diverse audience Absolutely. that you have been capitalizing on. So I love how you hit the diverse thought piece, right? And being reflective of that of the market that we serve. And, you know, I, I look at, you know, competition is, is one thing that I think is natural with athletes such as yourself, right? But compassion, and, and we're already, you already exude it in everything you've already said, is often missing by many, but, but you bring a spirit of compassion that I think impacts everyone who crosses paths with you i'm gonna ask the question of is that intentional i feel like i know the answer but why have you elected to be such a passionate empathetic human regardless of your status and success well first i can say um i have always lived by to whom much is given much is required it, and when you come from humble beginnings it, and you can lean into the word and know that i have been blessed throughout my life. People don't even know half of my story, but I look at being a young girl and being told by your grandma and your mom and um, other black women who you are around to be raised, that when the world looks at you, they see two things first before you even speak. They see a woman and they see that you're black. Now they can put two strikes on you. So you know how hard you have to work and how hard you have to compete to get to where you want to go. It's maybe hard to hear that as a young kid, but at the same time, I knew that getting to a place where I can make change so other kids didn't have to feel that or have that talk was important. And so I try to lead and live an authentic life. And I'm far from perfect. I make my mistakes. No, you're not supposed to be. You're perfectly imperfect. Perfectly imperfect. <laughs> exactly. But the, the beauty in that is that, and, and I think I said this, so I was doing an interview with the NBA and I said, listen, I said, they're like, what's your biggest failure? I said, I don't talk about failures. I don't really feel like I've had any. Every failure is a lesson, a life lesson to me. And if I'm not learning from that, I'm not evolving. I'm not growing. So yes, I've made my fair share of mistakes. Yes, I've had failures in your eyes, but failures to me Man. are lessons that's going to make me be better, a better Man. person, a mother, a better wife. And that's the beauty in being able to acknowledge that. So I think I try to lead with an authentic spirit, but I also try to be lead with compassion because when somebody can, you never know what person, like their representative or what wall they may have up, right? Yeah. But when you get past that part, that's when the connection and the good stuff starts happening, right? That's right. Um, and that's one of the reasons why even being here in New Orleans, when I first got here and I was advocating so hard, like we needed to have a female coach and Teresa Witherspoon was it. And I said, yes, it was because she was a Hall of Fame basketball player. Yes, I saw that she could get out there and show the guys like how to do certain things. But you want to know the number one thing? Esther, the number one thing, her ability to connect. Connect. And, and for knowing that the players could receive, that's elite for me. So when sometimes people are looking for coaches that can X and O's, when you have somebody that has a lot of all those tools, but their number one thing is the connectivity, that changes the game. So you know, you know what's interesting with that. So first off, she's one of my favorite players ever when she was a liberty at the Liberty. So I just want to make sure that goes on record. Um, and I'm share I'm, that. Yeah, please do. <laughs> and my thought is, you know, coming from a basketball background, um, I, I feel like a lot of those instincts are are very consistent with that of being a point guard, right? When you think about the role of a point guard, 
and putting people in position, setting them up for success. I feel like there's a very strong correlation to connecting with people because you really have to do the work to go deep into what they're all about, where they are comfortable, what do they like to do? How do they like to receive the ball? So it's it's like a connectivity that she's probably been doing all of her life. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it. And it's so when you're building not only a team and you're helping to build staffs and thinking about what the overarching thing is, is, you know, there are a lot of, of successful men. There's a lot of successful women. But when you talk about the culture, which was one of the biggest reasons I was brought to New Orleans mm -hmm. was to help change and cultivate the culture. Mm. I look for things differently to make us successful than the average person to me. And that's just how that's how I view it, because I've been in winning locker rooms. I've been a part of winning programs. And I take a little piece of everything and try to figure out how we make it our own. Where we are now. So so how is that? How's that been for you when you talk about you being brought in to help change the culture, being a, a black female um, on an executive team, right? And as crazy as it sounds, um, that's not seen often, right? This is not the norm yet. How has that been, that, that progression and that journey thus far? It's been a, it's a, be been a beautiful, humble journey. It, it has because... When you're in a locker room and you're playing the game, you can affect change because I can get out there and show you. That's right. I know when the practice isn't going right. I know how to pick it back up another level. So now you're having to figure out how you drive the culture in a different way when people are looking at you and understand you're in a room that's deciding whether they have employment or not. Hey. So you're you have to spend more time on the relationship. You have to get to know people deeper. You have to understand how to put them in a position to be comfortable to be able to maximize their potential and be successful individually in a job. And so that was that was challenging. But the first thing I did when I first got here, I didn't come in saying, I got all the answers, let's go. No. And I said, let's sit down and have some coffee. Let's sit down and have a tea. Let me get to know you. What's important to you, family? You don't spend enough time with your family. We're on the road. So we got to make opportunities where you get a chance to be able to spend time with family. We have to do Sophia. stuff that encompasses everybody's family. So. That's my approach and has been my approach. I love it. And so I think about all this and I ask, so so what drives Swing Cash? What drives me probably right now, um, it's been different at different stages of my life, but I think what really drives me is being the change. I mean, it's simple being change you want to see. I think I have two little boys that this country, this world is going in a direction at times that I don't like. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it and you're this mama bear that wants to see the world be better, I don't just want to see it be better for my son. I want to see it be better for everybody's son. So I have to do my part in what God has blessed me with. Mm -hmm. And so that's important. So it drives me every day to get up. Um, and instead of playing the game, I take that passion into another space. Mm -hmm. I take it into the front office, into the philanthropy side, into initiatives that are important to me for women. Um, and women in sports and women who look like me mm -hmm. uh, and women who want to be successful but maybe don't understand the pathway to get there. So I so like I said earlier in the, in the conversation, so who much is given, much, much is, is required. required. Listen, we, we start the show with that. I mean, and that's the story of my life as well, right? We, we understand the blessing of the positions we're being put in and the fact that we're vessels of purpose, right? Absolutely. We're not perfect by any means. However, we are those vessels and so as you were talking about, you know, empowering women and, and talking about the things you want to do there, what is your message, you know, to women that you feel is missing or not being said enough, you know, whether from other females or males or just leaders in the industry in general? I would say to women in general is that one, you are enough. Okay. I think we question a lot of times if we're enough, if we're capable if, 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 if you have to start with the positives uh, and affirmations of I am, That's right. I am. If you think about my hall of fame speech and I kept saying this, I know you have to tell yourself what you know about yourself, the positives, and then be able to chase your dream, then be able to step into a new career, a new space. Um, I do a lot of work in the space of women in sports because that's where I, I am right now. But I also can speak to a mom mm -hmm. who's 
figure out I'm having kids later in life and I'm at this point in my career. What does that look like? So my my message to a lot of women is let's start conversing in a way where we're supporting each other and not feeling like I'm the only one. I'll never take that approach of I'm the only one in the room because when you take that approach, you're hurting maybe generations of women right. that can have an opportunity. That's right. Yeah, and it goes back to something you said earlier about it's bigger than just you. Mm-hmm. This, this this whole thing is not just about us. And, you know, when you think about that, we definitely live in a time where I think marginalized voices are, are having their chance to speak up and be heard mm-hmm. a little bit more, right? And yet there's so many that still choose to be passive or remain silent. Um, why do you think that is? And, and how can we collectively do more to kind of help uplift others who perhaps want to join a movement but refrain from doing so? I tell people to start small. You look, They may look at me and at times they're like, well, you have this platform and you can do this. And I'm like, well, you have a community that's right around you. You have your family, your friends. If you can be a change within that group, that permeates outwards. And so right. I sometimes say, think of it being a small and then you can fan. And social media does it so fast for you that you'll get to that place. Um, there are a lot of marginalized people, not only here, but around the world. But I think the biggest thing that we can do is one, listen, and then two, support. Um, that's the biggest thing for me is how do we support? And sometimes just giving your voice in while you're in line and you see that somebody's being mistreated, being an right. ally and support in that moment when I'm in a shopping line and understanding that somebody's not doing right, will cha- it could be a change That's right. somebody's life. That's right. It can open up somebody else's eyes and people just need to realize every single day there's opportunities for you to have allyship or for you to be able to be an advocate. Yeah, I love that because it's not just the bright light moments, yeah. right? It's not those moments. It's it's the, the day-to-day moments that everyone does not see but has the big impact. And I think you mentioned, you know, social media, which gift and the curse, right? Uh-huh. It's a beautiful thing on so many sides. And then on other sides, it could be so detrimental. And in this case, as we're talking about this conversation, one of the points I think could be detrimental is that people just see this end goal. They don't see everything that happens before. They don't see the meat. No, seriously, right? It's kind of like I, I, I make the analogy to, you know, many of us grew up in what I call the um, the oven age, where we allow things to cook for a while, operation, uh-huh. marination, that thing would sit in the oven for a good three, four hours, and you get all the seasoning and everything's just working together and coming together over a period of time. And you're working through that process. We are very much microwave era right now. Put that thing in for 30 <laughs> seconds. Come right out. I want it to be amazing. They they on the air fryer now, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Evolu- you're right. <laughs> Evolution. <laughs> Operation <laughs> Evolution. Air fryer. You're Listen, that is, I'm, t- I'm using this one, by the way. I'm going to go three stages now. I'm going to go <laughs> oven, microwave, air fryer. Thank you. Yes. Even more so. But the air fryer is a pretty healthy option, though. <laughs> It, it doesn't matter if it's healthy. It's fast. It's fast. It's quick. It's quick. That's it's quick. And yeah. so to your point, it's about the process, right? And or it's how? about the day-to-day. It's not about the big one moment that everybody sees. It's about those moments that people don't see that we're doing that collective work for the betterment. And, I know. you know, I think with that, it, it leads into another thought or question I had. You know, for you... What does a utopian culture of success and, 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 and prosperity look like? Because you, you, you obviously have a state of where you want things to be within the NBA that we, ta- and that we talked about and across sports in general. But what does that look like as you take the necessary steps to create it, this utopian culture of success? I think what it looks like is that we stop using, we've gotten to a point in the sports industry, through the league, through the teams, where you no longer have to talk about the first, oh, she's the first, mm. she's the first, 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 first. And it's like, oh, great job. So-and-so was at this percentage. Oh, so-and-so was like, in this diversity category, they've done all of this work. And so you're more surprised by how expansive it is than you are by the first. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't be, and I think Adam Silver has talked about this and he's done a masterful job of saying, look, we have to get there. And I do believe there's going to be a female that's going to be the first coach ever in the NBA. I do believe there's going to be a female president of basketball operations for a team one day. But when we get there, we got to keep going. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we like to celebrate the first and then we don't know if there's two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so I think the accountability with the leagues, with the teams is important because the consumer wants to see that. If you think about the GP and where they're going right now, they want to see a a business, a company, a world, a country Mm. that is diverse in their thought how they are. And mm-hmm. so we have to think about the future from a business standpoint as well. And you see, all the time I tie this back to business because people always want to talk about Boom. the bottom line. The bottom line. Boom. The bottom line, this is part of it. And if you're not doing the work now, you're going to pay for it later. So why mm. not do the work now so that you don't have to pay for it later? So mm. that that's my utopian moment, moment would be we are at a place where there's no longer the talk about the first, but the diversity of how far we've come and how many women and how many, uh, you know, women and people of color are in these spaces and we're not keeping track anymore because it's yeah. a normal thing. Um, I, I would love for us to get there and not, and that's my prayer. Yeah, no. And I, and I love that. And I think a little bit of work that needs to be done there is, you know, with those who are privileged and entitled, there has to be some work to look in the mirror to say, okay, I'm probably not understanding this because I've never had to. Some of these things have never affected me before or even now. But if I am part of a larger community that's based around collective advancement and betterment, there has to be a look at the privilege and the entitlement element that has to be addressed and broken down and be open to putting yourselves in some uncomfortable positions to get comfortable. I always say get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? We, Because we can have this dialogue because we've had to live lives of being comfortable with being uncomfortable. We haven't had the privilege of entitlement and privilege in certain okay. cases, right? So as I'm hearing you talk about all the amazing things that need to happen in your utopia vision, which I love, you know, because even in your utopia vision, you know, I would love to see a day where there is no diversity and inclusion departments. Um, um, Why? Why? There, there shouldn't be, there wouldn't be a need, right? That That's, right. that's a utopian, uh, you know, vision for myself that I think complements everything that, that you're saying. And you ended your statement with, that's my prayer. And I, and I know that, you know, in my time of knowing you, it's evident, evident that you have such a firm grounding in your spiritual walk. And I obviously see it showing up across all the things that you do. Why is that so critical um, to you to keep God first in all things? I think the the reason why I keep, you know, my faith um, at the forefront and the foundation is because that's what it was built on. As a young girl, um, it was instilled in me in a way to not just look to the Bible or to be a Christian or to walk a certain way. It was to find God for myself. Your and relationship. I, I, yeah, the relationship piece. And it, so it wasn't, I was never raised to um, go through as we, not, not so much the process, but I wasn't raised to church with God. Uh, I was yeah. raised to find them for myself. And, and I loved my Nana for that because that's hard as a young kid. You're trying to figure it out, but when I did it, it was special to me. So um, I think the biggest thing for me is in, in having faith of my foundation, it allows me to also love in a different radical way. It allows me to have compassion and it allows me to ally with the human that people are Dang. instead of the titles that people may have. Dang. And so that's why I try to just lead in that way and, and lead in a, in a very caring, compassionate way. I love it. Um, you know, black culture, as we know it, is quite often borrowed, uh, appropriated, or used to inspire other cultures and industries. Talk about the importance of black ownership 
and recognition of what it is that black community, the black community has brought to not only the country, but really the world. <laughs> I say this all the time and, uh, it's, and I mean it with all my heart. Um, you know, black culture, black people, um, we are the culture mm. we drive. It's in everything. Um, it's in the music. It's in the seasoning. It's in what you're eating. It's what you're reading. It's what you're using. <laughs> um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nope. The problem I, I've always had with it is that people try to appropriate it and not celebrate it. And so that's where I am like, you know, it's one thing to take from the culture and then kind of build your own brand of what you want to be. And you, you're pulling from these different um, inspirations. But when you're taking and not being inspired, those are two different things, right, Asta? Yep. When you're taking from the culture, that's a problem. When you're inspired by the culture, now we can talk differently about that because it is right. inspired it has been for generations, as long as we all can remember. Um, I think if you look at the sports realm the, um, that I'm in, I can specifically speak about that. Culture has been, and the sports culture has been at the forefront from the civil rights movement. You look at the Bill Russells, the Muhammad Ali's. I mean, you look at, you go down and down, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. They have made the sports and the black culture movement, the civil rights movement, a thing that says we can be change agents. Mm -hmm. We're not just for your entertainment. We're not just to be inventors. We're not just to give you uh, right. ability to dance and be entertained. We are here to say that our lives, our human element matter in a way and to advocate in that space. So sports for me has always been the level playing field in a way where we can use sports as recognition to create change. Yeah, and you know, I, I got to be completely honest with you. I think there were moments in time in sport that I was slightly disappointed in the lack of a stance we took, what? right? I look back at the Kaepernick era in the NFL, right? I felt like that was a moment that we really could have galvanized around for change. <clears throat> I looked at, um, you know, the Clippers years ago with the owner, uh, and the team, uh, at that point, I think Chris Paul was there. Um, and I thought that was another moment for us to make a stand, to help shift and change, to really show like, this is no longer going to happen and we have to balance things out and do, th do some things uh, a little differently. And I felt those were significant missed moments for me. I but know. to be honest, I recently looked at what Dawn Staley did with mm -hmm. that whole BYU incident. And it was one of the things that I was super, super proud of. The way and the stance she took to say, okay, well, you know what? We're not going to play in Utah then. We're just not going to celebrate that. We're not going to do that anymore. And it was something that was in the media for a second. I don't think it was in there as long enough as it should have been to applaud this type of behavior, or more importantly, applaud the intent of what this was representing, right? And so I, I look at those moments as um, key, well, I look at the Dawn moment as a key one that I felt I was so proud of the stance she took. Yeah, and I think, um, and I, would, I want to comment on the part about Dawn because she has been and continues to be just phenomenal leader mm. in the space of what she's doing. Not only, and we'll talk about the pay equity too, that mm. she just out the water. But I wanted to comment on the piece you made uh, because I was a player at the time with the Donald Sterling situation that happened. And what I will say is this, I don't know outwardly, collectively, if the change happened in our community with, with what happened with mm -hmm. him, but that was the first time an owner had got full banned life yeah. from the NBA. Yeah. And for me as a player watching those players go and dump their jerseys and reverse their jerseys in the middle of the floor and then knowing at the time that Chris Paul was uh the president. That's right, the players association, of, right? Yes. He the conversations that I, I was, you know, involved with behind the scenes, behind the scenes that were happening. I was proud of those men. Yeah. I will say that I was proud because 
they were approaching it from a, we have change. We also have a business. How does this need to happen? And the the back and forth and being able to be there with the league and, and Adam Silver, I was really, really proud of him. So I do want to say that no, part, Esther, Esther, because thank you I, for that. Because context is everything, yeah. right? Because, you know, we're not privy to all the things. You know, we can make our assumptions or our assessments based off of what we know. So it's great to hear someone like yourself who was in the trenches to say, wait, hold up. Let me give you a little bit more context of the impact. Yeah, and I, but I do think that to your point, that as a community, that we could have continued to to push and say, okay, where do we go from here? What does that look Lord. like for us? Um, and even though it took a little bit longer, you now have a situation where we have X amount of you know front offices that are coming, people of color coming in front office, coaches, and so there's a lot of work still to be done. But I think that moment ignited some other things that you know through the years changed a little bit let me get back to my girl because you know Lon and i um 2004 and she's from philly so although she's on the other side of the state i still like to claim her Absolutely. a little bit I'm a You're thinking that's <laughs> yeah. western yeah. pa eastern pa well, i know yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like baltimore and dc <laughs> it is it is that's what we we four hours away everybody's like oh you close to philly no i'm in western pa right. pittsburgh right. that way so um the thing i'm so proud about don is there's never a change up. You're not going to move her off of what her foundation yeah. is. And have an example like that, that I've had throughout the years and watch how she not only gave back, but she used her voice and her platform. Dawn Staley right now has her contract and fought for her pay equity because she found out what the men's coach was yeah. making. You're talking about when they had the national championship and she put herself on the line and say, no, 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 no. This is what I'm going to need, the same as him here, and this is what I need moving forward. And so a lot of times you're you're nervous to be in that space because you're like, oh, it's women's basketball. I can't, I can't do that. She didn't approach it that way. She approached it as a boss yeah. and of this is what I'm doing. Let's go, you know, here for here. Um, and that to me, as somebody that's in my space and you know, somebody that can hit her up and ask questions and get feedback, I am just so proud of how. She's casting a wider net for other coaches. She won a national championship. You know what she did, Astra? Gave a piece. I saw of that. The I... Black female coach that was in the a country. She sent it out Thank to them. Thank you for mentioning that. I saw that piece the other day and thought how, it actually gave me goosebumps and I'm getting goosebumps again because what motivated her was she had been given. Yes. One that she held on to until she won her first championship, correct? Absolutely. So her pa and so see this is this is this is a, a great lesson lesson moment. She received this one. She then achieved the goal that this piece of fabric, this net represented. Upon ch achieving it, she spread the look at this, the net way wider. Yeah. What look cast it listen. And that is the opportunity we all have in our respective spaces, not just in life, yes. but within cultures to do the same. Absolutely. Take your piece of the net. Let's do what it is we need to do. Then spread that net so much wider that you're now empowering and motivating a much larger group to do the same in multiple areas. I'm so glad you brought that piece up. Because I literally yes. just saw that the other day and it gave me goosebumps. Even more of a fan of her. And to your point, I was already a major fan. Even when she played ball back in the day. She's a beast. But just that notion and the snowball infectious um, effect that she's created is so powerful. And that's what we, to your point, we all have an opportunity to do that. And that's the space that I live in right now. That is the space. And, and, I, and um, I see that because... As you've been talking about things and talking about what you're looking to do and you're doing, walk us through She's Got Time because I feel like that is like the perfect segue into why you're doing this, but I won't speak for you. No, you, you said it right. You talked about casting a wider net. And for me, uh, She's Got Time uh, has come, of, it's come, it's kind of like that baby. You talked about that thing that's been in the oven, right? You, 
uh, th- let's talk about a pie, right? It's in the oven. You have all the things that's in there. It's cooking, it's cooking, it's cooking. For so long, I've been in spaces all the time, whether it's I'm the first, whether it's in media or I'm in uh, the front office or I'm on uh, working with the leagues. And now being in the front office for so all, so many times I walk into a gym and an executive or a young girl or a woman it's, that's there as a director will come up and say, hey, how are you doing? I want to ask you some questions. Or another executive would say, how do I find somebody like you? And I would look and be like, I'm not a unicorn. There are a lot of women mm. that are out here working. And so what I thought about after a Hall of Fame speech, and we talked about this I know, right? We talked about moving it forward. And what I want to do with She's Got Time is to create this ecosystem for women who work in sports to be able to get the resources that they need to create this platform that gives you not only three pillars we have, the digital aspect of it, and telling the stories of so many women who work not only on teams, but work in media, that work in league offices, women who work with brands that deal with sports teams. We all have been in this silo and not really speaking to one another and need that level of support. And so I didn't want to just create something that's just for basketball operations or the league operations or business side. I wanted to create this full tribe and village where you can come feel supported and understand we're a resource throughout the year, creating membership, um, creating peer-to-peer uh, mentorship to create opportunities to be able to be at in real life events, whether it's Super Bowl, WNBA All-Star, coming not to just network, but to get fed. Mm. Get fed for real, right? How do we talk about negotiations? How do we talk about uh, what tracks are best, the best path for me to get to where I'm trying to be, whether it's an executive level, as a director, entry level? And so our first summit is going to happen June 28th through the 30th. And I'm super, super excited about it because when I tell you the roster of women who, when I picked up the phone, they said, what, what day? I'm there, exactly. let me know. We have women who are coming in to speak, Aster, that are from Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, across the board, financial institutions, brands. Um, so this She's Got Time is based on women in sports, entry level and above, who are trying to continue their career path, but want to get fed with, how, do I'm, how am I successful in, in my job? What do I need to think about when I'm talking about being a wife, a mother, raising kids? What does that look like? And also being successful in this space? And the third thing is, what's next for me? How do I feel? How do I, my, how's my wellness? How is my mental? How is my physical? And so I wanted to create what I didn't see for myself. Yeah. And so I'm super excited to do this and lean into this. Um, although I'm still working with the Pelicans and I have my job, sometimes you get pulled in so many ways. But when God says move, you move. And this That's... is one of those things that was bacon. And I said, it's time. And so That's... I'm super excited about this and um, all the women that will have an opportunity to be able to learn, grow, and share and not feel like we're the only one. That's right. So, and, and I can't thank you enough for the net that you're casting with this and the effects, infectious nature um, that I hope um, is accompanied by what you're doing because the hope is that many others will be inspired to do similar to things within their respective areas of importance. But I know you are going to do an amazing, amazing job with this, and we're obviously going to support you for it. So thank you for what you represent there and what you're doing. Um, so the opening scene to your life documentary is about to begin. The Swin Cash Story. What song is playing and why? Oh, oh that's a great question. Um, what song is playing in? Um, you know, there's so many songs and I fit I, in my head, I was going to go with, um, a DMX one. Cause everybody knows I was a huge fan of DMX. Nice. But I, I, I'm going to go with, um, Yolanda Adams. I'm going to yeah. be ready. Mm, why? I think because that song to me in every phase of my life I had to be ready so whether you're young life issues happen you grow up in the projects and 
you're always preparing yourself to be ready for what's next. You're always having to be prepared um, for whatever you're called on. And so I always felt like when I hear that song, it inspires me. Like I'm going to be ready. Whatever door is opening, whatever obstacle comes, um, whenever I fall down, the ability to get back up, like yeah. I'll be ready. So I think that that opening act is a, a great scene set um, because a lot of times when you're younger, you're in from humble beginnings, you don't know what's coming. No. So be ready. No, but if I may add on to that, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Amen. <laughs> so, look, we, we close these out um, with the question around three seeds that you'd want to leave with the stewards of culture moving forward. And, and we use the, the seed analogy um, because I, I feel like it's very much in alignment with that of how cultures are built, right? People work on something um, and they do this work, they plant this seed and then they water it, nourish it accordingly and it becomes this bigger thing that ever could have imagined, right? And some of it isn't due to their doings, right? It's other elements that might contribute to that. But I would love to hear from you what you feel are the three seeds that are the, of most importance for you for the stewards of culture moving forward. Oh, that's great. I think the three seeds for me would be... Um... One of being um, unapologetic yeah. in your approach. I think the second one would be um, leading with radical love. Yeah. Um, because I think that's that's something that even when you're, it's, things are difficult to be able to love in those radical moments is important. And the third thing would be just to live. I think there's so much anxiety, there's so much stress in everything that we do from your job to, you know, things that are happening just in society that to live and just to be is okay. So to exist in a space and to, to plant and to have a life that's, that's full is okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes everybody's chasing what's five or six years down the road. It's okay to build, but to live like in the moment for that's me right. is uh, really, really important. So powerful. Thank you for those seeds. And thank you for being an amazing seed um, and allowing God to continue to water you as the work in progress that you are and as we all are, but into the amazing individual who is literally doing this, not because of herself, but because of the amount of people you're trying to touch and inspire. I applaud you. I love you as a sis and everything that you represent, um, and we'll be here to continue to support you. But thank you so much for sharing just a little bit of your story and your amazing, amazing spirit. Thank you, Astor. I appreciate it. And make sure you hug those babies for me. They're not so small anymore, but not at all. <laughs> hug the family. We love y'all. Um, and, you know, we, we stay by it. To whom much is given, much is required for the both of us. So to the culture. To the culture. Thank you. <laughs>